Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me along. Uh, originally, I was uh, invited to travel physically to your location. And um, yes. I said that uh, I don't travel internationally anymore. And it seems that nobody else does either these days. So <laughs> yes. that's worked out quite well. Uh, so I'll be talking today mostly about uh, racism and research that we've done in Australia on that topic, but linking it in and, and forming parallels with uh, traveller health and mental health in particular uh, in Ireland. I'll start with a tradition that we have in Australia, which is to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which uh, I am placed today. The uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations uh, I acknowledge their custodianship of the land and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. So I should speak for about 20 minutes or so, and that'll give us plenty of time for questions afterwards. So first of all, uh, what is racism? There's, uh, there's many, many ways of tackling that question and there's many books and articles written about it. I've defined racism as something that's really about differences in um, power or opportunities or benefits or resources within a society uh, that has to do with race, culture, religion, and or language that in many ways are intertwined these days, these forms of identity. So it's about things that are avoidable and unfair that serve either to disadvantage minority groups within a particular social context or advantage majority group members and therefore entrench these kind of differentials in power. So it happens through uh, attitudes, individual attitudes that people have, beliefs, behaviours, but also beyond individuals, uh, the norms, the policies, the practices, either intentional or a lot of the time unintentional uh, that people are engaged with or organisations have as part of their standard operating um, procedures and approaches. So racism and ill health is something that has many associations that have been studied. This is a kind of a graphical representation of some of those. So we might talk about racial discrimination, which is the behavioral manifestation of racism as impacting on uh, psychological stress, particularly relevant to mental health. Uh, but also it's about um, reductions in the quality of um, resources or services or goods in society, um, everything from education to housing uh, to healthcare. And these assault, as a physical assault, is a very uh, tip of the iceberg but important aspect of racial discrimination. And these lead to various forms of psychological and physiological responses, uh, negative coping, maladaptive coping behaviours. Um, difficulty in healthcare and provider of other types of provider access and interactions, these sorts of things. And mental health outcomes of various sorts, and I'll provide some evidence of those more specifically, as well as increasingly physical health outcomes through this um, physiological stress uh, response pathways. Uh, so this was a summary chapter that I wrote about racism and indigenous health uh, a couple of years ago, really looking at how the health impacts of racism are uh, related to historical and ongoing forms of colonization and the way that that continues to impact Indigenous peoples around the world. Overall, across the world, about a third of Indigenous adults and a fifth of Indigenous children experience racism at least once, often a lot more than that during their lives. So that global evidence broadly found racism associated for Indigenous people with things like psychological distress, anxiety, depression, suicide, PTSD, asthma, physical illness, general physical illness, obesity, cardiovascular disease, blood pressure and hypertension, um, excess body fat, poor sleep, and general ill health, physical or mental, including some studies on oral health and an increasing number of studies generally in the field, but also relating to Indigenous people on health, negative health behaviours, such as alcohol, tobacco, and drug use. And also a lot of work now looking at uh, medical and health other healthcare services, and the way that uh, racism creates different access, different quality of communication and service, 
and different adherence to um, medical recommendations, for example, for Indigenous people. So in Australia, there's been a number of studies on racism and Indigenous health. Uh, there wasn't uh, very uh, much not long ago. Uh, when I finished my PhD on this topic in 2006, there was only two or three studies. But these days, there's dozens of studies. And um, these are the sort of outcomes. So we've We've been assessing racism in some of our national health surveys, uh, Indigenous health surveys in Australia for about 10 years or so now. This is one of them, National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Survey. And we found racism associated with poor health status, psychological distress, diabetes, smoking and substance use in that survey. Other outcomes that have been correlated uh, with racism, mostly in cross-sectional studies, depression, um, poor mental health in general, a lot of mental health outcomes. So it's, definitely uh, a stronger relationship between racism and mental health in, in the field generally than with physical health. But there are there's evidence of both. So here's an example of some recent work that we published about racism among older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. By older, we mean, uh, in this case, people over 45 years of age, which is you know, not really that old. But uh, as per some of the statistics that were quoted earlier for traveller health, we also have quite substantial uh, gaps in life expectancy in Australia as well. And um, so about 10 years uh, less, a decade less of life expectancy for Indigenous Australians compared to other Australians. So this was uh, some data analysed from one of our national surveys and we found racism among that age group to be associated with psychological distress. And this was amplified by the severity of racism. So how um, often uh, people experience racism um, kind of dose response relationship. And also we have asked some questions for a few years now about avoidance of racism. So how often do people try to avoid situations, whether it's um, particular places where they um, socialize or shop or perhaps even work settings um, where they try and avoid racism and what effect does that have? Um, and a lot of the time it's not very effective in reducing either their exposure or the impacts of racism that they do still experience. So we did some work on avoidance there, which also was associated with the health outcomes in this case. So racism in healthcare, education and the workplace in this particular study. Um, this was another study we published recently looking at the effects of interpersonal racism and avoidance behaviours, avoidance of racism by Indigenous people with a disability. So that's something that hadn't been studied in Australia previously and basically find that people with a disability, Aboriginal people with a disability um, were more likely to experience racism. Um, about 42% of those with a disability um, experienced racism compared to 32% of people without and various other factors um, that told us that you know this the odds of experiencing racism were more severe with the disability and and with those avoidance behaviors there's also been um, some work on indigenous youth in australia and impacts of racism exposure to racism and impacts and we find kind of similar stuff to the global uh, indigenous study of racism and the global study of racism in general so uh, correlations between racism and um, maladaptive health behaviours or damaging health behaviours, such as um, overconsumption of alcohol, smoking, uh, marijuana use, as well as su suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts, emotional behavioural difficulties, more mental health outcomes in another study, um, oral health outcomes as well, depression. So different parts of Australia with different cohorts of Indigenous youth, and we see quite similar associations and correlations with health outcomes. This is another study we did recently um, looking at defects of racism on socio-emotional well-being for Aboriginal Australian children in a part of Australia called South Australia. And we found, among other things, that exposure to racism was associated with adjusted point estimate of about 41% increase for total emotional and behavioural difficulties. Um, so younger children were more affected um, for total difficulties, older children for hyperactive behavior. So that, these are some of the kind of more specific work that's being done to look at um, particular mental health outcomes and social and emotional well-being, which is a 
<clears throat> mental health outcomes that we talk about uh, for Indigenous people in Australia quite often. We've also been looking at, in Australia and other parts of the world, have done a bit of a work on what we call um, setting specific impacts of racism. So it doesn't matter where you experience racism is a question. Um, is, is all racism equal or uh, racism experienced in some settings more damaging, perhaps more pre prevalent is one question, but what damage is done even if prevalence is not heightened. So a few years ago, we did some work here uh, that's in this slide about uh, Aboriginal people in the state of Victoria, where I live. And what we found is that um, about a third reported experiencing racism in healthcare settings, health settings, which is not particularly high in this survey um, compared to say in public places or education settings, employment or during sporting activities. But that racism had a stronger impact on people. So their, their odds of having high levels of psychological distress were higher if they experienced racism in healthcare settings compared to racism experienced in other settings. So the question is, why is that so? Um, what is it about certain settings that um, racism when experienced in them creates greater distress or greater um, damage in some way? We don't really understand why that happens, but it's important to think about uh, when we are doing work on racism and its health impacts and how to address it and where to focus um, efforts. So I don't know very much about travel health at all, but for this presentation, I did some research and um, I wouldn't say there's a lot of um, studies looking at um, travel health and racism, but there's some, some work that's pointing towards that. So this was a systematic review um, that I found quite recently published a couple of years ago. And they noted that you know, the organization of health systems, discrimination, culture and language, health literacy, service user attributes and economic barriers are all part of um, some of the problems with access and engagement with health services that are experienced by um, traveler populations. And they particularly did focus or mention experiences of discrimination as one of those factors, but not drawing from very um, many studies in this case. There's another study that was published very recently uh, this year from work that has been done um, for people on this group uh, in, this, in this call. And um, this was really, the conclusion of this was that travelers experience high levels of discrimination, which negatively affect their engagement with health services. So this is the All Island Traveler Health Study done some years ago, but some of the work published recently. And the result of that uh, the recommendation there is that more culturally competent services need to be developed to engage with those, the impacts of discrimination on engagement, access and effectiveness of health services. So on that topic of uh, cultural competency or anti-racism or reducing racial bias, there's many ways to talk about it. I just wanted to discuss some of that in the last part of the presentation. So here are some of the recommended approaches to reducing racial bias. Um, one of the most important is to understand the uh, ways that racism operates implicitly, explicitly, organisationally, systemically and so on, and to develop motivation to address and avoid those biases. So increasing perspective taking and empathy is a powerful uh, evidence of that in the, in the literature, understanding as I mentioned. Enhancing confidence, regulation, uh, regulating emotional responses, in other words, um, focusing on implicit bias and how that may impact your behavioural and interactional responses to others. In the medical setting, uh, building partnership with patients and attending to interactions with patients and focusing on individual uh, differences and also sameness and difference, I guess. So people as part of particular groups in society, but as individuals as well. Other people have done some work on what's called mental health first aid for racism, which is really about um, what you do in the instance of, of a witnessing or being told about or engaging with racism experiences, not so much personally as the target of racism, but as someone who can be an ally or can be a first responder or a bystander to these sort of incidents. And really what that's about is validation of those experiences. Um, not necessarily being responsible for fixing them in the moment, responding, of course, in the ways that may reduce them over the longer term, 
But I guess one of the biggest issues with racism really is um, it's um, there's a there's a strong sense of denial still in mainstream societies around the world that racism is a problem. So we live in a world where colorblind ideologies are quite prevalent. People don't want to talk about race or racism and certainly um, the denial of racism or the lack of a response to racism by bystanders, for example, is one of the biggest issues for victims and targets and something that uh, multiplies the damaging effects of racism on their mental health and physical health. So what not to say, you know, this pretty obvious stuff. Um, maybe they didn't mean it that way. Maybe you brought it on yourself. So avoiding victim blaming is very important. Um, minimizing it to uh, bad, bad apples. You know, this is just one person that happens in a lot of different contexts when we're trying to deal particularly with institutional forms of racism. Uh, a lot of institutions often say, oh, those are just a few ignorant types and nothing to do with us as an organization. It's a very common response. So a lot of things that you shouldn't say, um, which are invalidating, of course. So implicit racism or implicit racial bias, I've mentioned already, it's a lot of research these days on that topic uh, and something that we need to really think about because it will affect many of us. Um, there was a recent study in Australia showing that 70% of Australians have implicit bias against Indigenous people and that that figure was um, very similar across all sorts of ages and genders and demographic groups. So um, this is likely to impact on you in some way, personally. And so we need to grapple with our own implicit bias. You know, How can we be more mindful um, of when that might happen? How can we interrupt the association between that implicit reaction to different groups and our behaviors and interactions? and thinking about emotions and cognitions and motivations and all these things that can interrupt those associations, which not always, but sometimes come from these, um, uh, the effects of these in our minds onto our behavior. So effective interpersonal anti-racism is really about that reflection, that mindfulness, that being present and accountable for our behaviors and interrogating our feelings and values around these issues. Um, questioning validity of racism when you see it happening, even if you're not sure that it's happened, engaging in some way with things that can be offensive to people or may be damaging their opportunities or resources or possibilities for achieving, say, healthcare. Um, expressing reactions, noting offence, disagreeing, interjecting. This is all what you can do as someone who is an ally uh, to, to people who may experience racism. And sometimes as a target, this can be effective too. So mobilizing support and, of course, engaging institutional authorities and, and larger scale kind of organizational responses to um, what are often considered um, a kind of a series of unrelated events. And we need to connect those events within organizations to, to address racism in a systemic way. So being an effective anti-racist ally more generally is about, uh, and I think I've mentioned some of these, understanding yourself, reflecting on your own culture, your own society, what uh, influences in society have created uh, perhaps implicit bias in your own being, um, taking up space to combat and address racism, do that while remaining you know, able to listen and be humble and respect where other people are coming from, especially targets of racism. Really being able to engage with systemic institutional organizational racism that's everywhere as well. Um, how can we combat that? How can we um, understand narratives that minimize that, reframe those narratives? How can we be wise and steadfast when we act and learn from our mistakes? Because, um, you know, in cultural competency, uh, particular mistakes are kind of part of a path of the course or part of the journey. We understand why you're an activist. What are you trying to achieve in terms of organizational change, inclusion of minority groups, transformation of systems, um, obsolescence of certain parts of systems. So for example, um, calls in the US through Black Lives Matter to abolish police departments. This is a, a very new and welcome idea. And that sort of obsolescence of parts of systems can be part of what we aim for rather than simply inclusion or transformation. 
There's been some reviews recently looking at uh, broadly frameworks for working with organisations. This is just a fairly general one about reducing inequality um, in organisations uh, in healthcare contexts. So looking at community needs, patient populations, gaps, payment structures, what's the organisational culture, where are the levers for change within that culture in, in relation to institutional and structural racism. How can we look at levels from micro to macro? What are sort of outcomes and performance measures to think about? And how can you sustain and institutionalize and embed these sort of inequality reduction activities? Because um, the longevity of them is very important because this is a problem that doesn't go away quickly and needs to be uh, constantly reflected on. Another one also healthcare settings. So a lot of work on anti-racism and cultural competency in healthcare, particularly given that healthcare, that cultural competency will kind of originated in healthcare. So they suggest needs and monitoring, needs assessment and monitoring, thinking about recruitment and the diversity within organisations, including leadership, um, training, um, provision of interpreters, many things like that. And data collection and management is very important when you're trying to engage in anti-racism to understand where the gaps are for certain populations and have good data to analyse that over time. Um, continuity of care, integration, these sorts of ideas, outreach, sorts of ideas. And these are great papers to refer to if you're interested in doing any kind of organizationally focused work. And coming up to the last couple of slides, this is important, um, the paper that um, I've read a while back. And what the paper is really highlighting is that um, when we undertake anti-racism work, we have to do so with great respect and humility for the perspective and the cultures of the people we are trying to uh, work with, um, the oppression that we are trying to overcome as allies um, together for our own benefit and for the benefit of society. So um, the point they're making in this paper really is that we should not have projects that are aimed at correcting presumed deficiencies in ethnic populations. And in fact, we have to be careful that the notion of integration um, does not sort of re-embed ideas of racism through what are essentially assimilationist approaches. So there's a danger that anti-racism becomes an, an exercise in assimilation when it really should be an exercise in uh, empowerment of existing difference among various cultural groups. And this is just an example from Australia of what happens when um, some Aboriginal researchers in mental health publish uh, a diagram about what does social and emotional well-being, which we talk about more in Australia than mental health, what does that look like from an Indigenous perspective? You know, this is the, these are the things that are important to Indigenous people, as, as articulated by these um, colleagues of mine who are Aboriginal um, scholars. So you have a, a strong sense of connection. How are we connected as peoples to, um, to country, which is the word we use for the land that we live on, to our culture, to our community, to our family and kin, and within ourselves, you know, our mind and our emotions, um, overcoming that kind of Cartesian mind-body dualism, and also to our ancestors and spirituality, and how are various social, political, and historical factors um, sort of circulating around and either uh, allowing and reinforcing or, or preventing and precluding these kind of connections that are considered to be very important for Aboriginal people's health. And that's all, thank you.